you know, I don't, I, I don't know about you, but sometimes I have these moments where, where I almost, it's, it, it's out of frustration or, or it's out of desire or it's out of even just a zeal to obey the Lord. But I have these moments when I basically cry out to God and say, will you just be clear? Can you just tell me what you want me to do? Listen, zeal for being faithful to you is not what I'm lacking. What I'm lacking is direction. What I'm lacking is clarity. What I'm lacking is just not knowing what to do, when to do it, and sometimes even how to do it. I don't know about you, but sometimes I, I get frustrated because I feel like, I feel like at times the Lord's playing games with me. Just tell me what you want me to do, and I'll do it. And then I come across a passage like Micah chapter 6, verse 8. <laughs> and I realize that, that it may not be so much of an issue of the, of the Lord not being clear as it is an issue of me not wanting to accept what is clear. I don't know if you've read much of the prophets, or, or maybe you have and it's been a while, but when you read the prophets, clarity is not one of the things they are lacking. If anything, they are so painfully clear that it becomes overwhelming to endure everything that it is that they are revealing. Like if you're reading Isaiah, you can't, you are not confused about why the Lord is upset. He is obvious. I mean, if you're reading Ezekiel, He's going through elaborate, dramatic presentations, even bringing the prophet up to the throne room to make sure everything is clear, or Jeremiah. But then when you get to the minor prophets, your Amos and your Joel and your Malachi and your Micahs, the Lord is not lacking clarity. I'm lacking the courage to respond to what it is that he says clearly. The, to, to set up Micah, uh, the Lord is not happy with his people. <laughs> they are just focusing on their own plans and bypassing the Lord's plans and, and engaging in and even believing false prophets and, and the leaders and the prophets are even rebuked by the Lord and the Lord lays out what his desire is and even gives promises to those that obey. And then in chapter 6, the Lord just starts laying into Israel. Verse 1, listen to what the Lord says. Stand up, plead my case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what, I, what you have to say. Hear, you mountains, the Lord's accusation. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a case against his people. Notice what he's doing. He is calling all of creation as witnesses in his case against his disobedient people. If creation gave a testimony in a court case, either on your behalf or against you, how would it speak? Oh, not sure many of us want to really engage that one. He is lodging a charge against Israel. My people, what have I done to you? Explain to me this, this rebellion. How have I burdened you? He asks in verse three, answer me. I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. Remember that? I sent Moses to lead you, also Aaron and Miriam. Remember that? Verse 5. My people, remember what, what Balak, king of Maab, plotted, or what Balaam, son of Baor, answered. Remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. Do you remember the evil done against you? Do you remember the good done for you? Do you remember... With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of oil, olive oil? Do you hear the question? Lord, will you just tell me? Just tell me what to do. Just tell me how to respond. 
Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and ten thousands rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? What do you want me to do, Lord? And then comes verse 8. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? Here's the answer. You ready? Act justly. Love mercy. And walk humbly with your God. It's pretty clear. What does the Lord require of you? To act justly. I find it very strange that in the church... <clears throat> acts of justice towards the poor and towards the marginalized are controversial. To be completely honest, if I were Satan, I would not only want to make it controversial, I would want to make it very confusing. Yet the prophets are pretty clear. And Jesus himself, even whenever God became flesh, he was pretty clear. He expects us to care for the least of these. For how we treat the least of these has something to do with how we treat Christ himself. What does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to take care of the orphan and the widow, to look after the poor, to fight for the outcast and the marginalized. For in the same way that God found you on the fringes of salvation, we too need to seek and save the lost, to act justly. The acts that you do matter. And to love mercy, to be in love with giving people mercy, relenting what it is that they deserve, and instead forgiving, offering grace to those that don't deserve it. What does the Lord require? To act justly and to love mercy. And these two are summarized by the third. To walk humbly with your God. No, this doesn't, this isn't actually a passage about pride. It's a passage about knowing exactly who God is. And in light of that, exactly who you are. And offering that gift to everyone around you. You see, what I have found in, in the midst of my frustration, for the Lord to be clear, I found that he's actually pretty clear. The problem isn't with his articulation. The problem is with my embrace of what the Lord requires. For what does the Lord require? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. And the crazy thing is, is if, we all did this as individuals. The church would look a lot different. And dare I say, so too would the world. I love you guys. Have a good week.